past one o'clock, we have a good group here and I see all of our panelists. So thank you everyone for joining us for our second um, alumni webinar series panel, Sustainable Development Within Social Justice. Thank you so much to Doveb for um, moderating today and a huge thank you for our four panelists who are here today to spend their time with you. We're so grateful for them donating their time to discuss this topic with you. So similar to the last webinar panel, you'll also have time for a Q&A at the end. So definitely take advantage of it. Try to um, mute yourselves, of course, but maybe take off, like make sure your video is on because I'm gonna take down the slide in just a moment. And it'll be nice for the panelists to see who they're talking with and interacting with. It's kind of nice to see the room full of faces. And um, as well as I'm sure you saw on the LinkedIn group, we tagged them on LinkedIn. So take a look at their LinkedIn's as well and connect with them after if you don't have a chance to ask all of your questions today. But we're looking forward to it and you can take it away, Dovab. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks, Alexis. So yeah, we're uh, excited to have the second edition of our uh, alumni panel webinars. And again, the uh, goal of today is to really uh, take a look at the broad field of sustainability and the many career paths that our alumni um, may consider as they transition into your professional careers. And we've got a great panel today. I'll introduce them in a second. Um, and just want to say thanks to, to all of them and to Alexis for the incredible coordination that you're lending to the program and to this panel as well. So thanks. And it's great to see all of you as well. Um, so I will just do a quick introduction uh, so you know who you're hearing from, and then I'm going to kick it really to our stars. I'm just here to kind of provide the administrative, administrative background here um, and let them really take it away and tell you a lot more about what they're up to. And advice for you is, again, you go through the uh, program this summer and then launch right into your careers um, as you go forward. So um, with that being said, also, please feel free to use the chat. Um, you can certainly uh, put questions in there. Alexis and I will, uh, mod will uh, monitor that, and then we can use that to also seed um, a discussion that we'll have after we hear from our panelists, which is always great because we want to hear from you. Questions, so really, you know, uh, you know, no question uh, will will go unanswered. And also, we really want to have you uh, lend your voice to this. So please feel free, and we'll encourage you to use that. Also, you can raise your hand as well if you want to speak your question or have a comment instead. So. Don't be shy, and we really want you to, to uh, participate and engage in this today um, actively. So, all right. So, with that, let me introduce our rock stars here. So, um, uh, first, I want to tell you a little bit about Kat Morris. Uh, Kat is a sustainability fellow alum from the 2021 cohort. Yes, Kat, you are a rock star, uh, and earned her Master of Public Policy degree from the University of Connecticut. Uh, while at UConn, she founded the Collaborative Organizing Initiative to promote solidarity and intersectionality in social and environmental justice movements and currently organizes grassroots and legislative action and speaks on various panels and podcasts and freelances as a consultant. Whew. Her most recent professional positions include working as the policy intern for Connecticut's Health Equity Solutions and um, Sustainability Fellow for the uh, EPA uh, and also serving uh, her Helen Gurley Brown Fellowship at CEEJH, the Center for Community Engagement, Environmental Justice, and Health. She's also currently organizing the first annual Seaside Sounds for Environmental Justice Festival in Bridgeport, Connecticut. I'm hoping to free up time that I can go down to that. It's going to be awesome. Uh, it's a real exciting initiative that uh, we'll hear, I'm sure, more about from Kat. And uh, that's all she's up to. So just a few things. Uh, Alex Freed uh, is the founder of the Post Landfill Action Network, a national nonprofit network that has worked with over 900 campuses across the US working towards zero waste. Uh, PLAN provides leadership training and best practices, best practices guidance to achieve zero waste to our students and staff and hosts the annual Students for Zero Waste Conference and Beyond Waste Student Summits. Uh, Alex graduated from UNH in 2013, uh, where he started the UNH Trash and Treasure Program, which was PLAN's first program model. Uh, Alex is a Udall Scholar, a Brower Youth Leader, and was named the New Hampshire Young, and, uh, Young Entrepreneur of the Year in 2015. In 2020, Alex stepped down from his role as co-executive director of PLAN, and today Alex is director of PLAN's Atlas Zero Waste Program. In 2021, PLAN launched the Atlas Zero Waste Certi Certification 
the first zero waste certification program for college campuses. And I can say Alex is just an esteemed alumni and uh, we're so lucky to have him with us and we're really looking forward to hearing a lot more uh, from him in the next hour. Uh, Connor McFarland. Connor participated in the 2016 Social Innovation Internship Program and was placed at the Resident-Owned Communities New Hampshire Program, ROC NH, of the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund. Uh, following Connor's graduation from UNH, where he earned a BS in Econ and a minor in Spanish, uh, Connor landed at the Resident-Owned Communities New Hampshire uh, program again, where he focused on organizing and consulting with residents of manufactured housing park cooperatives. Uh, since May of 2019, Connor has been working as the development manager for the Local Enterprise Assistance Fund, which provides loans and technical assistance to cooperative businesses throughout the United States and small businesses down in Massachusetts, with his primary responsibilities, including fundraising, investor relations, and partnership development. And then finally, but certainly not least in any way, uh, Andreas Mujea uh, is a, a close colleague of mine. I've known him for a very long time. Uh, Andres is a Black, Latinx, bisexual cisman who has been living in the Seacoast area for the past 12 years and comes from a family of seven siblings, a Dominican father, and a powerful Puerto Rican mother straight out of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, Andres serves as the director of uh, DEI and justice for the New Hampshire School Administration uh, in Exeter uh, and is the first DEIJ director in the New Hampshire public school system, which is, I can't even begin to describe how formative and really significant that is um, within the state and the region and the work that he's doing, which again, you'll hear a lot more about. Uh, Andrea serves on the board of directors for Black Lives Matter Seacoast and is a member of the advisory board for the Endowment for Health, Race and Equity Series. He also serves on the leadership team for the Equity Leaders Fellowship in New Hampshire. Uh, Andreas is a former program manager for New Hampshire Listens at the Carsey School of Public Policy here at UNH and uh, worked there to host equity workshops and facilitating courageous and difficult conversations across the New Hampshire uh, state between community members. Really fat, really uh, terrific organization. They do tremendous work over there. And Andreas is currently a member uh, still of the New Hampshire Listens Advisory Group. Uh, so with that then, I've said a lot, but I want to really uh, turn it over uh, to our panel um, and also just by way of introduction. Uh, I have a couple roles at UNH myself. Um, I'm a dean at the graduate school where I work on student affairs for masters uh, and doctoral students. And then I'm also a fellow for the Sustainability Institute, which brings me to you. And I get the pleasure of helping to coordinate the fellows program uh, and also working with that NEMS network that I described to you um, that works across New England on climate and sustainable initiatives. It's wonderful work and I'm so honored to be a part of that. So with that then, um, what I'd like to do, not true, Kat, but thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, turn it over to each of our panelists. We'll just go kind of across the board here and ask each of them to introduce themselves a bit more in detail and maybe talk briefly about what they are doing now. Uh, so with that, maybe I will start with Kat, if you can take the microphone. Sure. <clears throat> Uh, rough start. Um, sure. So Kat Morris, she, her pronouns. Um, I consider myself a scholar activist. I've been engaging in work to kind of address the environmental racism that I experienced like in real time, but also then, you know, through school and education, got a better understanding of how it was related to different aspects of systemic racism. Um, I want to do that in a way, though, that is kind of a celebration of life because I don't, uh, I've come to realize that a lot of people who do EJ work don't necessarily have a deep connection to nature. Um, that, but I do. And so that kind of avenue is really important for me to kind of explore in the sense that like, I'm very much working at the intersections of, you know, environmental justice health, and health equity, but I come from the lens of One Health. If folks have heard of that, has anyone heard of that? A quick raise of hands. Nobody, right? That's a problem. So One Health is a really straightforward kind of concept that really comes from like indigenous roots, but it's about just recognizing and acting off of the acknowledgement that human health, ecological health, right? It's like plant health, but not, and animal health are all intertwined because we exist in the ecosystem. And that's kind of what fuels kind of how I navigate um, 
responding to health inequities and environmental racism, right? So like the solution should be benefiting all three of those factors at once. And I think that facilitates sustainability um, in a holistic manner. So that's kind of how I go about environmental justice. Um, again, doing it in a way that celebrates life and culture because something I've also noticed in a lot of my time, especially you know in the communities, the EJ communities I've lived in, in Connecticut, there's a disregard really for those communities in a way that, you know, requires or perpetuates a blatant disregard for the people's culture and kind of their value as people in general. And so for me, the EJ work um, has to entail celebrating culture, it has to entail rehumanizing people, it has to entail like making sure that people understand that, you know, there's a lot of <clears throat> there's a lot, sorry, there's a lot of life to work for, work towards and work for, right? And it's all worth saving, it's all worth protecting. Um, so that's what EJ means to me. I do that in different ways. I also am a nerd, so the scholar part it really is in that hyphens. I like to do a lot of research. Um, that's kind of a lot of what I did at Siege, and that's what I, also what I did at the EPA <laughs> somehow. Um, so it's it's really important to me to connect to people and connect to the environment and to facilitate that connection to other people in a way that inspires action at a policy level and at a programmatic level. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> Perfect, thanks Kat. Uh, Connor, do you wanna tell us a bit more about yourself and your work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I'm Connor McFarland. I use he, him uh, pronouns. Um, and uh, Dovev kind of alluded to how I started my career. I've been in the workforce for about five years now, graduated from UNH in 2017. And I think I had a really unique start um, to my career. Um, basically that Rock NH program that was discussed um, was a lot of community organizing in mobile home parks throughout the state of New Hampshire. And so to me, that was just a very, as an economics major, I guess going into college, I wasn't really expecting that type of experience. Um, but being able to combine that community organizing and that really human element of going to these communities throughout the state that are often low income communities um, that are dealing with their own challenges um, within the community um, and in their own individual lives. Um, but being able to kind of pair that community element with the, I'll call it impact finance or capital structure that are that's used um, to help those residents purchase the communities um, and own and operate them themselves as opposed to a private real estate investor um, just kind of increasing rents year over year and selling it to a private equity firm um, so being able to combine that like i said that human element but also the creative finance element really um, pushed me to continue working in the CDFI industry, which is the Community Development Financial Institution industry. Um, it's gotten um, pretty large, the, the industry itself. It was uh, founded through the, the CDFI fund of the U US Treasury. Um, so that's definitely like something you could look at. There's a lot of resources out there um, about CDFIs in general. Um, and so after a few years of working with those communities, and um, it's a very you know, that program, it's a lot of the same community organizing work, a lot of the same types of loans being made, and, and it's all in New Hampshire. Uh, I found an opportunity to work at a CDFI that was a little just more broad based in their impact. Um, so at the Local Enterprise Assistance Fund, I've been able to kind of work with uh, a lender that lends nationally, um, and we prioritize healthy food access, um, access to affordable housing, um, and economic and financial inclusion. Um, and so I can uh, maybe in the next uh, next question, I can get in a little bit to our uh, about our work specifically with those program areas. Um, but that's been my path over the last few years, um, and I'm looking forward to uh, continuing this work. I also started and got this interest in a microfinance class with Michael Swack, who's uh, pretty well known at UNH. So uh, just give him a shout out there, and I can pass it on uh, to Alex. Um, he's, who, he's who I see on the screen. So. Terrific. Thanks, Connor. And yeah, Michael Swack is terrific. Uh, double shout out. And I would totally agree. Uh, Alex, the floor is all yours. Cool. Thanks. Uh, my name is Alex. I use he him pronouns. Um, yeah, that intro was was pretty comprehensive. Um, I graduated from UNH in 2013. My friends and I started the UNH Trash to Treasure program, which is a student run move out collection program. Uh, that leads to a yard sale of materials for students coming back in the fall. Um, my friends and I uh, 
we, we were in touch with campuses, a, a number of students on campuses across the country in the spring of 2013 when I was heading towards graduation. And we'd been helping a number of campuses kind of kick off these move out programs. Um, and we kind of took a leap and decided to start a nonprofit with the goal of supporting student leaders on college campuses with development, primarily at the beginning of move out programs, but then eventually into a broader scale focus of zero waste initiatives. Um, plan is coming up on our 10th anniversary. So uh, that's pretty exciting. And as, uh, as we said in the intro, in the last nine years, we've supported over 900 college campuses. Um, we've engaged over 50,000 students in this work. So it's been a pretty wild journey. It, it, it grew pretty fast. Uh, we currently have nine full-time staff and about 30 fellows and part-time folks that are paid through the organization right now, um, located in pretty much every state across the country. Uh, and the projects continue to grow. Um, I'll say more, I know there's other questions for us to focus on here, so I can definitely get into more detail about some of the, the work that we're doing and the focus on social and environmental justice within that work. Um, briefly for, for my role, um, we early on within the organization felt that it was important to have a co-executive leadership team. So um, one of our first hires as an organization was someone who is today is currently the co-executive director. Um, uh, their name is Faye. Faye and I served as uh, co-directors for a number of years. And in, uh, in 2018, we went through a really comprehensive kind of analysis of the organization and built out what we referred to as our mandate for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Should be happy to drop a link to. It's a public website on our, or a public page on our website. Um, a result of that was many things, but one of those things was that I decided to step down from my leadership role within the organization. Um, and there's a lot that I think is, is kind of interesting about the, um, the analysis of uh, what the role of a founder is within an organization over a long-term period. I think there's a lot to be said about why founders are not necessarily the best directors of, of project work um, or of, of the organization's work overall. Um, I was very interested in kind of seeing college campuses functionally achieve zero waste. And as plan grew and grew, um, my focus on that definitely distracted from the overall work of staff management and um, kind of building the organization and supporting people. Um, so I stepped down from my role as an executive director and I was hired by the organization to lead up kind of an innovation wing, um, which is when we launched the Atlas Zero Waste Program. Um, and we last year launched the first certification for zero waste campuses. So. Um, I now oversee uh, a part of the organization. I'm a staff member under um, a co-executive leadership team. Uh, it's been a really fun journey to kind of explore what it looks like for, uh, for anyone in a position of power, especially someone with my positionality as like a white cis hetero man um, to step down from leadership and to, uh, to work underneath new folks who are leading the organization as the founder. So happy to speak to that experience as well. Terrific. Thanks, Alex. We'd love to hear a lot more about that. Uh, and then rounding out our uh, panel again, uh, Andreas, would you take the mic? Uh, yes. Hola, everyone. My name is Andres Mejia. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, thank you all for inviting me to be here today. Um, you know, I, I guess a little bit, a little bit more about myself is, you know, I consider myself a community organizer and activist, <laughs> social justice person, um, it's, it's been my passion. It's what I do, um, across the state, not only in New Hampshire, but also in Massachusetts, um, in different school districts and also doing community, uh, footwork. Um, you know, at first I started doing, uh, uh, social justice work for survival. You know, I moved to New Hampshire 12 years ago as a, as a, as a black man and, uh, didn't realize why certain people were, uh, you know, staring at me certain ways or, or, or not choosing me for certain things or just, uh, use, you know, saying nasty things, calling me the N-word. So I started to get involved, like, why is this happening? Um, other folks took me and said, this is what's happening and, 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 and gave me vocabulary and language to what was happening, my life experiences, um, which I call social justice. <laughs> um, and, uh, 
that's how I got involved. And since then, that's just the work uh, that I do in all the roles I've held. I've, I've made sure that I've um, advocated and, and, and uh, shared the voices and the experiences of uh, people from marginalized, historically marginalized communities. Um, so people of color, people from the LGBT plus community, um, you know, people with ability, disabilities, and, and so on. Um, and, and I just, that's, that's, I feel like my, my role and my purpose <laughs> in this place. And, 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 a, and a big part of it is uh, realizing what's happening and seeing what's happening across our state and our country and, 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 and advocating and, and, and doing this work even more to, to let people of color, um, people from the LGBTQ community know uh, that they have a right to be here in the state of New Hampshire, that this is their state. Um, and they can be leaders, they can, uh, you know, navigate spaces, they can be themselves, and, and, and we're supposed to be here. Um, so I think that's, that's a, a big part of my work um, is, is, and letting, you know, people, you know, uh, you know, pe people who are white, who hold a lot of powerful positions in our state, uh, know that there are many people of color here, <laughs> you know, that, that we do have to uh, make changes and change policy and, and and change the way we do things because it's it's not we're not only a white state we're not only a state that has straight folks in it so that's the work I do you know I've in many different roles as uh, when when Dovev uh, read my bio um, you know all the different parts I, I touch in New Hampshire uh, my current role um, is is as director of DIJ for SAU 16 which uh, oversees seven school districts um, and 11 schools. Um, so do, pushing equity work, um, working with educators and, and, and uh, caregivers, uh, parents, um, students, principals, school leaders, superintendent's office, uh, to make sure that everything everyone's doing is with an equity lens. You know, what representation do we have in the classroom? How are we supporting our students of color? How are we supporting our students who are dealing with homophobia, transphobia, and so on? Um, what what new policies do we have in place to protect our students? What you know, I work a lot on on bias and discrimination protocols, reporting protocols. What protocols do we have in place when these bias incidents happen? Um, a big part of my job is recruitment and retention for educators of color and other educators with marginalized identities, um, and and that's a big part of my role. Um, so that's what I do, and and whatever space I walk into, I, I let people know that. There's no other reason for me to be in that space but to advocate for people in marginalized communities. You know, if, 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 if I wasn't supposed to be there, then you would hire not someone in this position, you wouldn't have this position and just hire someone who has been working in the system and think the system's okay, because that's what's already been happening. Um, but you create these new positions to make some noise, get into good trouble, you know, um, and, uh, you know, uh, make change. Um, and I can talk a little bit more after what that actually feels like and looks like <laughs> um, yeah. doing that work yeah. in, in a space like New Hampshire. Great. Thanks, Andreas. And there's so many themes from the four of you that I want to pick up on. Um, I'll start with asking, we've got so many of our fellows are asking how do they, you know, get into social justice based work and also how do you really create an impact? I'd like to hear from the four of you. Um, based on your perspectives from your career so far, what would you give for some pearls of wisdom and advice to those two core questions? How do you get into this work? And then how do you really, what are the best ways to really start to create real impacts? Um, I will start with Kat. I'm gonna assume you're gonna start with me each time now. So I'm trying to get ready. <clears throat> um, so yeah, for me um, and kind of what, it sounded like from Andreas, um, it's a lot of it was personal experience. It was kind of like I was reacting, at first reacting and then responding. And I can talk about that in a second. I was reacting to what was happening around me. Um, I was reacting to what I was seeing in my environment. And especially comparatively, because I had lived in like predominantly white areas before where I was experiencing interpersonal racism rather than like systemic racism in a sense. Um, whereas then when I moved to predominantly black and brown areas, it was more systemic. Um, 
So in high school, I didn't really know what to do. So my reaction was to like volunteer. And I did a lot of different types of volunteering. So that looked like beach cleanups to kind of in, interacting with my environmentalism, um, but also like cooking at food kitchens or um, volunteering at church services that do stuff like that to serve community members. Um, once I got to college, I was doing different forms of outreach, so doing presentations around campus to respond to, you know, gender-based violence, um, racism, sexual assault, and um, addictions and stuff. So that looked like me trying to, like, get other people engaged in the work um, just so they'd be able to respond and intervene. <clears throat> it was a bystander intervention program, so there was a lot of educational outreach that avenue. Um, and then I wanted to get more, I guess, more specific or more targeted about it. So then I started, um, I started connecting with people who were doing campus organizing in different ways. So they were doing racial justice organizing or um, zero waste organizing, or like, I don't know if y'all have PERG where y'all are from. So those types of people or the USG people. And we got into different forms of organizing. I realized like no one's collaborating. There's no solidarity. Everyone's kind of like, trying to everyone's reinventing the wheel like in a classroom next to each other like it was weird so then I created Yukon Collaborative Organizing to kind of facilitate collaboration to um, bridge those gaps whether it be you know across undergraduate organizers um, but then also between you know with the graduate student organizers and the faculty members who are with it so I think a lot of it is to just find what's happening more immediately like in front of you what are you like reacting to and then figure out a more intentional way to respond to it based on the resources that you have based on the passions that you have based on the skills that you have and when you're doing it that way it, mu it makes it much easier to channel your energy productively because if you're kind of just going about it the way that you see someone else going about it like if you're like okay I'm gonna do what Kat does but you have no interest in public speaking you have no interest in uh, research, you have no interest in doing the different types of work that, you know, some activists that you saw elsewhere or some community organizer that you saw elsewhere is doing, I think that is um, counterproductive and it will facilitate burnout. I'm not even sure if I'm answering this question properly right now, but I feel like it's really a matter of like figuring out what's most important to you um, in your immediate surroundings that you want to change? What resources do you have to do that? How does that align with your skill set and your passion? Um, and then directing your energy intentionally that way, but really getting together with other people doing that work, because if you want to respond to an issue, odds are someone else does too. You're likely not the only person who kind of have, has noticed something and wants to do something. Um, so that's kind of how I would say you can get into work. I would also say, in my time, I've also kind of like I mentioned before, different people have different motives. And so you kind of have to be cognizant of that when you start interacting with other people, because, you know, it might be that there are intersecting issues with some problem that you're trying to address, right? So for me, environmental justice, that's a very intersectional issue. That's racial justice, that's health equity, um, that's land back, so that's uh, indigenous rights. Um, and just general climate resilience and that response. So there's multiple points of that, but someone who might be in the same organization as me or might be working on the same project as me might only care about one of those things or maybe two of those things. And so that can create rifts into how you see things that can, that easily creates a difference in perspective um, that you have to kind of get some consensus on. So that's also something I'd say to be cognizant of. I was wondering, Doga, do you mind, like, after asking the questions, could you put them in the chat? <laughs> this I'm, like, making sure I'm on mark. No problem. No, you're right on, right on. Okay. You, but, you're right there, but I'll put that in for sure. Cool. So, thanks. Um, but, yeah, I think that's it. But most of it is just, you know, just ask around. Nike, just do it. You'll find something. Yeah, that's great. And I've got, I've got follow-up thoughts. on. I, I love that notion about leaning into your skills and interests. I think it's such a huge piece of it for sure. We'll come back around to that. And thanks, Kat. Connor, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I'm rereading the question here, but I, I, I got it. Um, I would say just for um, advice sake, um, the couple things I had written down that I think are useful um, would be 
you know, it's hard to know exactly what you want to do, but maybe try to get an idea of um, what you don't want to do. Like for me, studying economics um, and having an interest in finance, I knew I didn't really, I knew I didn't really want to work at a bank. I knew I didn't want to work at an investment manager. Um, and that kind of helped me <laughs> retweet. That helped me, uh, just guided me along the process. Um, another thing that I think you all heard before is definitely leverage your network. I mentioned uh, Michael Swack is my microfinance professor. He actually, I did like an informational interview um, with my current boss now when I was a senior in college. So, and that kind of worked out luckily for, for me, but it can show the power of your network, right? Like you just, I met him once and then you come back for a first round of interviews and that definitely helps you along the way. Um, and then the other advice I would have um, would just be to trust your gut. Like you can be doing a certain job or uh, having a certain experience and it could be just a fine experience for other people, but it might not be a good fit for you. Um, I think even in my first job, I had been doing it for like a little over three years and I was just kind of ready for something new. And I, and it, you know, the next, um, you know, the next decision I made put me on, on a, a path that's been great. And so I would just, uh, anticipate or suggest doing that. Um, and then in terms of, um, just getting into this work, um, and one of the best ways to create real impacts, um, on getting into this work, uh, I think finding resources that are somewhat aligned with what you want to do uh, can be helpful. Like, for example, I looked and found my current job. at It's like the Opportunity Finance Network. Um, and so different kind of like trade associations or networks um, or just online resources in general that can help you kind of look for opportunities um, and read about opportunities. That, that would be some, some advice uh, that I would have. And then in terms of making an impact, um, I think at our organization, each of us um, makes impact in different ways within the organization, but I would just really uh, focus on, on going to an organization that really does prioritize the impact they're making. Uh, there are a lot of like publicly traded companies, a lot of companies that are really just focused on the bottom line. And, um, and that's fine for some people if that's what you wanna be doing, but um, there are also a lot of mission-driven organizations that are still financially sustainable. Um, so yeah, in terms of, that's how I would answer those a couple questions. Um, and yeah, I'd hand, off, hand it off to whoever's next. Great, thanks Hunter. And we'll, again, we'll follow up the connecting networks. Absolutely, yeah. and that's one plus. Those of you who know me know I'm probably 90 years old at heart and I don't really engage as much as maybe I should on social media and things, but I'll say one upside is way easier to get connected than ever. And you can actually just ping people that are high up in all kinds of, associations and other networks involved in social justice and you it's not hard to get those interviews have a chat um so really don't be shy and i would really encourage you as karen said lean into those and you might pick up something and get networked and get some opportunities as well so thanks connor alex what about you cool um yeah so i have two quick thoughts on this uh definitely echoing the previous things that were shared connor networking cat um like identifying that like kind of intersection of skill set and passion, I think is a really key point here. Um, the, the framework that plan uses, so as I said, we work with college students all across the country. I do a lot of conversations with students like this. Um, we use a theory of change that is called the points of intervention framework. So I'm gonna actually share a resource if anyone wants to check this out further. There's a really great book called Beautiful Trouble. Um, Beautiful Trouble is a kind of toolbox for activism and change. Um, and the idea is to kind of help you identify like where you fit into the intersection and network of um, actions and things to get involved in. Um, but to use this kind of points of intervention concept, um, we live in a very broken world. There's a lot of really terrible things that are happening and the systems are extremely overwhelming. So I think for a lot of college students, especially, that experience of like realizing like this is wrong this is like the layers and layers and layers and layers of institutional oppression and systems that are fucked up um can be really hard to learn about um and then figuring out like where do you fit into all of it can be really overwhelming so the idea of the points of intervention framework is to say essentially no one can do everything but everyone can do something and so the concept of poi is to conduct a systemic analysis look at the whole system 
and then to figure out what is my intervention point? Where do I fit into the system? And to be okay that that is your intervention point. So not all of us can be involved in, you know, the innovation side of um, producing new products, maybe that like help, you know, I don't know, solar panels or whatever, right? Like there can be folks who work in the industry side of it and there can also be folks who lock themselves to oil pipelines. And we, we need both. We need all the people doing these things, right? So the idea of points of intervention is to say, you know, the linear consumption economy, the capitalist system, institutional systems of oppression are all really problematic. And we need everyone in the room to figure out where they fit in the system and then to do that really well. Figure out where your intersection is of uh, your passion and your skill set. where you wanna, you know, do you wanna work on policy? Do you wanna work on uh, starting an organic farm? Do you, like, what do you wanna do that like helps to dismantle the layers of this broken linear system? Um, so that's part of it is like, I encourage you to check out the Beautiful Trouble website. It's a great toolbox to kind of start to explore that concept. Um, and the other thing that I wanna say is uh, as far as like, um, how do you get in? I think the, the question of how do you get in this panel and this conversation is also focused specifically on social justice. Um, and so to speak to um, uh, privilege and positionality, um, there's a lot to unpack in terms of how our own institutions, whether you're working at an organization or you're in a college, you're, you're a student on a college campus, or um, you're working in a company or you're starting something, um, to look at like, how that institution upholds systems of white supremacy culture and what does it look like to analyze and assess and address and change systems of white supremacy culture so if anyone isn't familiar with um, the white supremacy culture toolkit and framework i'll also copy a link here um, this is something that like plan did um, a number of years ago so in in 2017 our approach to this was uh, to kind of use this as a toolkit um, to kind of work through like how do these things show up in our organization? Um, and then what does it look like for us to build what eventually became our mandate for diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, we sought to kind of do this work internally. So we really sought to kind of figure out like how do we address each component of this? How do we address like the ways in which our internal systems work, our hiring policy, the way that we structure our own systems of equity and inclusion, how do we provide services to the people that we work with? There's a kind of a lot of layers to this. Um, and then we, after doing our own internal work, we sought out consultants and we brought in folks to kind of criticize our work and analyze and assess what we were doing and give us feedback on what our process was. So um, <clears throat> if you're in a space of exploring that, I would say, you know, what does it look like to address wherever you're working and whatever you're working on, um, systems of white supremacy culture within the work that you're doing. Thank you, Alex. And uh, I will absolutely check out the Beautiful Trouble site and the book. And uh, I, again, I cannot underscore and echo enough that notion that you put out there as far as like, what's your role in this? Don't try to do everything, figure out how you could best fit into uh, untangling these things. So thank you. Andreas. So um, how do you get into this space of work? I, I think, you know, to, to, to get into this space of work, um, you need to work on yourself, you know, do a lot of self-work. Um, you know, it's, it's I, I like how people touched across the different parts of our lives, institutions, the places we work, you know, our networking. And, and also, I, I, you know, look at yourself here, try to figure out your own story, um, which allows you to be in places and hear other people's stories. Um, all of us are here in this space, like looking on these Zoom screens and listening to what we're receiving right now with our own perspective and our own life experiences. Like all of us had a different story that got us to all sitting here on the screen together. And what was that story? What are your identities? What happened to you? Um, what privileges did you have? What uh, you know, struggles or challenges you might have had maybe because of certain identities. Um, you know, why are you involved in, in, in the work you're doing? What, why do you have your passions? All of us got to a place where we're at because of past experiences. And I think when we, we figure that out, it lets us know I'm supposed to be in this work. <laughs> you know, like no, 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 like no one can ever tell me that I'm not supposed to be in the spaces I'm in. 
because I've done all this work of discovering who I am, listen to my story, why, why do I navigate these spaces? Why do I fight the fight? Why do I uh, show up and be on panels like this and share our stories and share our knowledge and experience? You know, it's, it's, it's because I've done my work to be in this space. Um, so I think that's a big part of it because we can be in a lot of spaces and not know, am I supposed to be here? Should I be giving up? Should I even be doing this? Should I even be listening to these people? Um, and I can say in, in, in my work that understanding my story um, and then allowing space for others to understand their story and, and where they're at in life um, allows us to work together better, even when we disagree. You know, we can disagree, we might understand each other. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, when I say that, I don't say put yourself in spaces that are harmful to any of your identities or, or you as a human being. That's, I, I don't agree with that. What I'm saying is, you know, put yourself in spaces where you might be with someone who's saying something different or have a different perspective. And for me is when I connect with people and I put myself in these spaces, even for the first time, you know, am I supposed to be in this space? Is this the work I'm supposed to be doing? I sit there and I listen to what this person's saying. And I really want to know how did they get to this perspective? How did they get to be in this space? You know, how did they get to be in the space to say that LGBTQ people shouldn't be in this space or shouldn't have certain rights? Um, you know, how did they get to the space to say uh, that people of color shouldn't be in leadership roles or that black lives don't matter? Again, not when it's becoming harmful, when you do your self work and you hear your own story and you get to the place of understanding who you are, sometimes that allows you to be in other spaces to hear negative things being said. Um, but then that allows you to be able to sit in that space and make the changes and fight back, speak up, you know, rather than, you know, I can't be in this space because, you know, I, I, I don't feel good or I don't understand why they're saying that or mm -hmm. it hurts me. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that's my biggest piece of advice is 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 to find yourself like who you are your story why you're sitting in this space why do you care about these passions um and then another, like everyone mentioned networking <laughs> is the biggest I, I can say I've made it to all my spaces and I've been in uh, a lot of doors opened up for me because of networking um and connecting to folks even if it was for one time or even if I didn't even want to be at that event, like, yo, I'd rather just chill and go have a coffee at the, co you know, mm -hmm. I, like, <laughs> let me just go really quick and, 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 and show my face. Mm -hmm. So networking is important. That's, that's one of the, the biggest parts. And that opens a lot of doors. Yeah. For you. Terrific. Thanks, Andreas. And yeah, that connection between knowing, checking yourself, why am I doing this? Who am I? What are my core values here? Uh, and then it's almost counterintuitive that that can then get you a much better sense of, you know, how you're, connecting and also how other folks might be thinking about things on a different level. Uh, so critical. So thank you for that. Um, so I've got more questions, but I want to leave this. Uh, Alexis had noted in the pre meeting notes to all of us that this will go back quickly. It has and then some. So we've only got 15 minutes left. I want to make sure we leave time for all the fellows questions. And I already see some coming in. So I'm going to start taking those and then we can fill in my last questions as we kind of go through. So um, uh, Catherine Taylor uh, so wrote in. Uh, to everyone, uh, she'll be pursuing a master's in environmental econ. What topics in environmental justice would be most useful to research in your opinions and or cause the most impact? And I'll open that up to everyone for a uh, response. Wait, was that towards me, Deva? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, it just keeps like me in to go on mute. Okay, no problem. So, well, thanks. I, I already see Alex and uh, Kat have written back. Yeah, I'd say in um, environmental economics, um, I, from the little I learned, well, a, a decent amount <laughs> of economics I learned in getting my master's in public policy. Um, a lot of what I've gotten into debates with actually with professors was them talking about like not thinking that investing in climate resilience is like financially um, worthwhile. So I think that's an avenue that's really good because like, you know, I don't know, maybe using the costs of damage from 
climate disasters and figuring out, you know, the cost benefit analysis of investing in different forms of resiliency. Um, using the, you know, whole scale costs of health inequities and, you know, the cost of, you know, a poor public health in general, right? Increased death rates, how is that impacting the economy, productivity in the economy? And so that can be more justification for how we transition to green energy and close down incinerators that are giving people cancer and asthma. Um, <laughs> if you want to work with um, industries or, rather government specifically because they love economics to justify things you could speak towards like what is the economic benefit of having of like having these social safety nets that are very specific to climate change and environmental justice in the sense that um when i was working at the epa and i love jeff my mentor shout out to jeff the experience was great but like one thing that you know the research i was doing in my time there which was focused on stakeholder engagement and facilitating more environmental justice through the epa with nonprofits with local government um etc um with the various you know from federal to regional epa everyone just said, listen, we need more money. Like you need to either come fix this problem or you need to give us the money to fix this problem. But the pushback was like, oh, we don't know if we can actually do that. And I'm like, sweetie, if the EPA can afford to fix the problem, <laughs> who can? Like, tell me tru truthfully, like, how does that make sense? You know what I mean? Um, things like that. So environmental economics, I think is super important, not just because, like, not just because that's going to, um, really validate the work. We all know the work is necessary. We know we're well past the time that we should have started this work, but I think it's super important to be able to like, uh, kind of similar to what Andreas was saying, like argue the points that other people who are against you might um, have, right? Like have your rebuttals, but like, no, actually it is economically feasible to start investing in this now, um, or we see how much we're losing by not doing this. Um, yeah. And make it intersectional, right? Because I think there's so many, so many aspects of this that we don't even think about with respect to social and environmental justice. So for me, like when we talk about environmentalism, like immigrant, like immigration rights, immigration policy, that's incredibly important. We can't, we can't, you know, move forward with climate responding to climate change without acknowledging how the climate refugee crisis and the influx that we will continue to have is going to impact our infrastructure, our economy, we need more housing, we need more public transit and so on and so forth. Terrific, thanks Kat. Uh, Alex, thanks for also putting in some really thoughtful response. Anything else to add to that or do you want to leave that as it is? I think we can make time for other conversation. Yeah. Okay, great. Other questions? Raise your hand, put it in the chat. All right, well, while we're um, you know, allowing time for more questions to come in from the fellows, I just want to do one last round, uh, which is could maybe each of our panelists maybe just pick one existing opportunity or initiative that you're particularly excited about that you think has some real legs and some real you know, uh, you know, things that we could really build on to make some impact and move forward. Connor, I'll start with you. I'll shake up the uh, order a little bit, not to put you on the spot. Yeah, just in general. So in general, we as in like a society or kind of our anything that you think is interesting and could be really something that might be a good way to really focus efforts on and build on. Yeah, um, I, I think one piece of uh, our work and that has resonated with me most and I think is going to continue to be, be important um, is food value chains in general. And so we do a lot of like healthy food lending throughout the value chain, anywhere from farms to retailers. Um, and I just think that the local food movements are kind of like ready to um, ready to just continue the growth that has happened in the last couple decades, uh, whether it's through food cooperatives um, or just any healthy food retailers. Uh, that's one priority we have is investing in low income, low, low food access areas. And that also ties into in general, just uh, like social determinants of health and like whatever address you're born at, essentially there are likelihoods of different health outcomes that you have in the future. Um, and so just that's something I'm personally passionate about. I would say regenerative agriculture along with just investing in the food value chain. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so really that's just comes down to knowing where your food comes from. Um, um, and yeah, so I just think that principle is something that I'm passionate about and um, glad I can do in both my professional and personal life. So terrific. Yeah. And food systems are obviously so overarching and cover every single possible thing that we can think about. So that's a really good uh, suggestion, Connor. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Andreas, what about you? There's a lot. I'm trying to think of what. <laughs> Pick one. Pick one. I think I think one uh, one I would say is um, what's happening across our and it's because I'm in, in the field of education, <laughs> so I'm gonna uh, what's happening across our country of of certain bills and laws being passed to teach true history um, or, or 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 all sides of history um, is is to make noise to follow what's happening in all your uh, different parts. Uh, of the country that you navigate or of the state that you navigate and see what's happening, what, what laws are being passed, what are schools being said they can't teach, um, uh, what they can't say right now in New Hampshire. Um, uh, there's a law that was passed in last June that uh, you, know, you can't say white people are racist or that men are sexist. You know, you have to, you know, you, you can't, which is keeping a lot of educators, teachers from teaching the true history. So there's racism and, uh, sexism and homophobia happening in the classrooms and teachers are not speaking about it now because or stopping this discrimination because they don't know if they'll lose their license because if you break this law you lose your your teaching license um so it's see what's happening across your different spaces and and uh, that you navigate and and advocate for it you know make some noise saying we want the truth to be uh heard and and so on. I think that's one one initiative I would uh, fully back up and tell people to put the energy towards because um, the only people that are getting hurt in, in all this is the students at the school having to go to school every day um, and being told that they don't belong or that their life experience and stories don't matter. Um, so yeah, that's just uh, one, one thing I would say to, to tackle if you, if you have the, the energy and the time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Andreas. Yeah. Alex. Um, it's a good question. Uh, I, at the risk of, of being a little depressing, but also hopefully uplifting at the same time, um, I think something that is not talked about enough, but also is a significant opportunity for us, is that the movement against single-use plastics is growing at a significant pace. While at the same time, we are losing the fight. Um, the petrochemical industry is projected to more than double, which is absolutely astonishing by 2030. Some predictions are they're at about $340 billion in annual revenue and expecting to reach a trillion by 2030. So we're seeing just like shocking, massive amounts of growth in the petrochemical industry. Um, in the United States, the petrochemical industry has centered on three areas. Uh, Cancer Alley along the Mississippi River, the Ohio River Valley, and the Gulf Coast. All three of them are major environmental justice fights. Um, these are, you know, uh, areas of the country that um, are largely low income and minority populations, and petrochemical facilities are terrible in all kinds of ways. Um, so that's the bad. And then the good is we're starting to see huge fights to limit single-use disposable plastic production, we're seeing actual wins in stopping the siting and building of petrochemical facilities in these three areas. There are huge coalitions being built with like major organizational names like Greenpeace and Sierra Club are like starting to get behind this fight finally. Um, and uh, there's a lot happening on the local level to like switch restaurants, to switch, you know, college campus dining facilities. Um, to make major strides in like statewide policy. So there's a lot that needs to happen to kind of work on this. And again, points of intervention, you know, we need all kinds of solutions. We need composting, we need, you know, institutional reusable systems. We need just uh, redesigns of products and packaging. Um, and we need everyone kind of involved in that in one way or another. So uh, whether you want to uh, lock yourself to a construction vehicle or whether you want to be involved in policy and planning or logistics and innovation. 
uh, would love to see folks get involved in that fight. Terrific. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, just pick, pick something and do it, right? We can't just sit around and wait. And that, that the, you know, concept um, that Alex talked about as far as local and state initiatives and that there is progress to be had. Um, I just found out this morning at the conference I'm at right now, the state of Rhode Island just passed finally a full ban on plastic bags. I'm not sure when it's going to exact, but that's been in the works for quite some time. I've seen a lot of the insider because I talked to folks a lot. I've seen how it's going up and down with their efforts. It's finally gotten through. So there are wins to be had. I know it takes a lot and it feels really slow, but we got to believe that there are ways to be at least getting those local wins and the idea is that maybe those pile up into something much bigger. So thanks, Alex. Um, Kat, do you want to round us out? And then we can probably start to close off, unfortunately. Yeah, this really did go by super, super fast, yeah. but great combo. Um, kind of very different from what everyone else said. <laughs> uh, I would say lean into pleasure activism. You really got to, you really got to sustain yourself as a human being, like you're alive and you, um, you aren't going to be able to continue in this work if it brings you down. If you're not going to be able to keep making a positive impact, if the work that you're doing, the way you're going about it is unsustainable or unsustainable for you as an individual. Um, so again, finding the avenues to do something that are in line with your passion, that facilitate your happiness and development as a person. Um, I would say that's kind of how I would go about it. And I, the movement I'm referencing would be the pleasure activism movement um, in a way that is in line with, you know, the words of the late MLK or Sartre and, um, you know, bell hooks, working towards radical love, like working in action towards making your community one that is kind of built on a foundation of love and compassion, to me, I think is helpful because so much of the issues that we have today, a lot of them come from the fact that we live in a society that decided that capitalism matters more than life, period. Like period, right? So, you know, like we are saying, we know we need to stop the plastics, but no, because I want a trillion dollars, right? So that's kind of moving in opposite direction of that, moving in a direction that celebrates life. And that is um, for the sustainability of life at an individual level, so yourself as someone doing this work, um, at a community level, at a state level, and eventually at a global level. That's what I would say yeah. is the direction to go in. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, that's something that took me a long time to realize in my work in the space was to not go it alone. Uh, find people that you really enjoy working with and lean into those interests. I mean, I like to, for example, I like to cook and play soccer and listen to music, and I found ways to really engage the social justice work that I do through things that I enjoy. And it makes it that much more just robust and also much more fun to, to engage it. It shouldn't, it's not always be fun, but it should ultimately feel, you know, like it's you and that it, there is joy coming out of it. So those are wonderful comments, Kat, and thank you. We are out of time. I think we need a part two. What do you all think? Not today, but <laughs> at some point soon. So um, this was an outstanding panel. Thank you so much to, Connor, Kat, Alex, and Andreas, and for Alexis for organizing all this. This was really good. And to all the fellows for all the great questions and the discussion. So um, there's a lot to be unpacked here. Um, we know that none of this gets solved today by any means. Um, just want to give a quick shout out. As I've mentioned before, the alumni network that I helped to coordinate along with some other fellows, um, we've essentially really organized our efforts uh, as alumni network people largely around the concept of social justice. We're doing brown bags that will talk about these issues. We have a semi kind of podcast club that is going on. So as you get into your alumni world and probably we'll start leaning more into uh, your interests this summer as well, um, there'll be much more on this to come. And uh, we're real excited to keep engaging all of you and talk about ways that we can work together on this critical issue. So uh, any last thoughts before we sign off? Well, we didn't know. get too much of a chance to highlight Kat's event. So I just wanted to mention that it the, the links, Kat put them in. Everyone can check it out. Um, we'll make sure everyone knows. Kat, yeah. Thank you so much. yeah. Maybe Kat, if you could send Alexis uh, a uh, brief of the event coming up in July, and we could send that around to all you. Uh, for any who wants to go, that sounds like a wonderful opportunity. And again, I'm hoping to be there as well. And it's in the chat as well. Yeah. 
I'll do that, Kat. No worries. You sent I yeah. so many resources we have you sent. So I'll okay, do cool. So I'll message you. All right. Have a great day, y'all. Thanks. Thanks. So everyone. Thank uh, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. This is terrific. And uh oh, wait, keep fighting the good fight, make good trouble, and we'll talk to you all very soon.